Music came in off the streets and settled down comfortably as a part of everyone's furniture. By the 1970s, everyone knew it wasn't going to go away, and the excellence of groups like the Beatles, for example, seemed self-evident too. The best pop music's always dealt in opposites. It's got to be serious, but never pompous. Fresh, but not too bland. Fun, but not frivolous. Commercial, yes, but not just a sellout. One group that manages to do all these things, and what's more, is very firmly made in New Zealand, is the group Split Ends. They've been walking these various tight ropes for a decade now, and they're still picking up bouquets and awards for the quality of their music. In the company of Ian Fraser, we filmed them at work in both Australia and New Zealand, and came up with a few insights that made them a lot more real to many people for whom pop music is usually a matter of grimaces and earplugs. Here they are again, split ends. We had no doubt that what we had was good and we could take it to the world eventually, you know, take it to the to the furthest extreme. We really believed it and that's what got us through the otherwise sort of crippling years of a, a seeming apathy in New Zealand. It was, we had complete belief we were above it all almost. You know, it was ridiculous, the arrogance, I suppose. But I think we needed that to get through that New Zealand thing of it's local and it must be sort of scungy. <laughs> Ten years ago, they made the finals of television's New Faces contest. They didn't win. Ten years on, they're top of the bill at Sweetwaters. The split ends, history never repeats. In New Zealand, through the early 70s, split ends had a big cult following. They experimented with outlandish stage gear. They played music that dared to be different. And year after year, they were voted the band most likely to succeed without actually cracking the mass market. Split ends have become one of New Zealand's most successful exports. Australia is now their adopted homeland. But they got to Australia by a roundabout route. For a long time, they were knocking on the door in Britain, earning a respectable following with their music, it was called Mental Rock in Britain, and with their crazy stage act, which made Split Ends prophets of punk. But that British door never opened quite wide enough, and these days, they're based in the city on the Yarra, Melbourne. Split Ends was one of the strangest looking bands in London. Musically too, they were out on a limb. They decided to streamline things to move towards the sound they make now. The streamlining begins here, at rehearsal. Split Ends is not a band which waits till the spirit moves. They really work at their sound. Is it more important to you to be a, a recording or a performing band? Both have their part, but I think ultimately there's more satisfaction in recording because it, it's there for good in a way. It's a little piece of vinyl to haunt you. It's when, it's when you move ahead as well as a band on the road, you tend to, after a couple of months, you tend to get into a bit of a rut at times and, you know, your playing doesn't improve. When you get into the studio, everything's far more exact and so obviously the pressure's on. But it's exciting. It's a much more creative process, um, recording in the studio, than what it is on stage, usually. Sometimes on stage it's great, as we've spoken about before. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes on stage it's, it's brilliant. Sometimes horrible. it goes on tape, which is great, as well, when we record our live gigs. But um, usually it's better recording. I find it. Yeah, so, it is, it is do, more do, satisfying. Do you, do you so? No? So. <laughs> so what? Stop trying to be zany. The leader and founder of Split Ends is Tim Thin. What was it that led him to form Split Ends? Something unique and original that he wanted to say? Or was it something less noble, like wanting to be famous? Well, we obviously felt we had something to say. We were trying to give expression to the feelings and thoughts that we had about life and about our lives at that time. 
but it was all quite inward looking. The lyrics were very self-absorbed. Um, but also, we yeah, we wanted to, ever since I've been a kid, I've wanted everyone to love me, you know. It's sad, but it's true. I was born in Tiawamutu, 25th of June, 1952. Ten pounds of boy, all the way, all the way, all the way. My mother and father's pride and joy. Tim Finn from Tiawamutu, and that's about as far away from the hub of the music business as you can get. Tim Finn was born in Tiawamutu nearly 31 years ago. He left home to go to boarding school in Auckland, later to Auckland University. I left home at the age of 13, went to boarding school on a scholarship. Small fish, big sea, all the way, all the way, all the way. No more happy childhood well, days sorry. for me. We we not the Catholic condition. Adelaide, heat. <laughs> 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 the heat <laughs> I get the picture of parents who were really prepared, in fact, extremely willing to allow you to express yourselves as freely as possible. Were there any limits to that that uh, you were aware of? There were li moral limits, obviously. They were, you know, we were, we were a Catholic family and quite a, you know, my parents particularly quite strongly that way. So there was obviously moral limits. They, they were upset to see us doing anything that, that uh, was immoral, I suppose, but uh, the, any normal parents, particularly from that generation, would, would have been exactly like that, I think. Yeah. But within that, they always, you know, you always knew, no matter what you did, that they wouldn't be the sort of parents that would disown you or something, you know, there was, all, there was a strong bond there. Neil Finn's six years younger than his brother. He and Tim played together as kids, and they still play together. On April the 7th, 1977, he was summoned to London to join the group. We're talking about the family thing. It is quite unusual, I think, in rock bands to find two brothers uh, playing together. Do you find yourselves competing with each other? In a good way, yeah, for sure. Around the time of, say, True Colours, when Neil was really coming into his own as a writer, um, that was a really good time for me because it gave me a kick up the bum, you know. He was coming out with all these little gems and um, even though I knew that he had it in him all the time, it was a real shock in a way when he started coming out with it, you know. Particularly in the marketplace, I mean, it's one thing to sit around and sing a song, it's another thing to watch it go, you know, boom, up to number one and stay there for eight weeks, blah, 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 and since then he's written others that have done similar things. So, you know, in terms of songwriting, it's fantastic for me. I, in the old days with, with uh, Phil Judd, you know, he and I were amazingly competitive but in a not a very healthy way with neil and i it's it's really good you know it's much more healthy because we're brothers so whatever um competitiveness there is is still a bond that goes beyond it eddie rayner piano electric keyboards vocals joined split ends early in 1974 When you look at Eddie Rayner in the middle of the band on a big stage, Extreme left. with all this, with all this electronic gear around, yeah, yeah, it's weird. Yeah, because all the stuff is being, in a sense, projected outwards. I mean, you, to what extent are you playing for yourself when you're up there? Um, probably me more than anybody, or maybe perhaps me and Noel. When I'm up on stage, it's, it's very much a job for me because uh, there's so much mental work. I can't, I find it, sorry, I, I find it very hard these days to um, be up on stage and play to the audience um, for a lot of the time because I'm constantly thinking about what I have to do next. There's so many changes, so many different sounds, so many uh, different types of echoes and effects to put on those sounds and changes within songs and and it's just uh it's it's a it's a lot of work to be done up there and i find that um all the all the sort of showmanship or 90 percent of it is, you know belongs to the guys who are in the front noel and i up the back are just sort of um we're doing the work we're basically the anchor people behind the band <laughs> noel crombie drums 
fine arts graduate and chief influence on the way Split Ends looks. He designs the album covers and directs the band's video material. And he's the one who created the costumes that made Split Ends one of the strangest groups seen anywhere, any time. Initially, you know, as, as always, really, the music came first and um, once we got into the situation of performing, you know, the stage presentation was also a facet of it, but uh, the music tended to dictate the way things looked to a large extent and still does, really. Um, particularly, you know, like one, each album is, is a step, really, and uh, titles, album titles and just the atmosphere on the, of the music on an album uh, usually suggest some sort of direction, you know, that the pre stage sort of presentation will take. We wanted to show it, I suppose, by the way we looked. You know, this isn't just another band. This isn't just another, you know, band that's going to get up there and play cover versions all night. We have our own identity and we have, you know, something that's going to stick around. You won't get rid of us. Here we are. But ah, you know, it was very sort of, it was like that, I think. And then Noel, of course, a friend from art school days, he, he just to start, started designing costumes and that took it to the next extreme. Till then we'd dressed up, but it used to appall us that people would sometimes sort of see a camp or, or glam aspect to it, which we never felt. We didn't feel that way. We felt, I don't know, it was pretty hodgepodge until Noel sort of synthesised it all, but it was more surreal or something. It was supposed to, not supposed to be, it was kind of vague and abstract. We didn't really know what we were trying to look like. We certainly weren't trying to look like pansies we were still too, you know, sort of locked into that whole butch, seemingly butch New Zealand thing, I suppose, initially. But, um, I don't know, we just went off on a tangent. I remember the first night Noel showed us these costumes was in a dressing room in Hamilton. We first wore them in Hamilton. And we all just fell about laughing. We couldn't believe them. They were just so perfect for what we wanted. <laughs> and it just went on and on. Bass player Nigel Griggs is the only non-New Zealander in split ends. 33 years old, English. He joined the band the day after Neil Finn in April 1977. Yeah, well, I was actually uh, in France when I first heard of it. I was living in France for two years prior to join, joining Split Ends. And um, Malcolm Green was uh, just joined as drummer at that time, and he sent me a, uh, the most terrific poster I think they ever made and told me he'd just joined this band. I knew nothing about them at the time. And he said he joined this band, and then they had their teeth blacked out, and uh, Phil, Phil was shaved, and uh, pretty extreme costumes, makeup, Noel's hair. So I had a good laugh, you know. Good old Malcolm. Is 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 that? I I, I couldn't take him seriously, and so I, I suppose I understood that uh, that for a while a lot of people didn't take them serious enough, and I think it held them back up for a while because it held held me back. Uh, my first impressions was that I couldn't take them seriously. Even though I sat down and listened to the music and quite liked, quite liked uh, one side of Mental Notes, because that was all I heard in the early days. You, you joined the Going Concern in 1977. Well, was it? Well, in many ways it was. <laughs> I mean, I know that it's changed. That no, event eventually it was, but in 77, I, I don't know if it was quite so obvious. It was, I mean... Well, that's well, intriguing. Are you... Uh, <laughs> Well, I thought, I mean, I had a lot of, obviously believed in the group, but at the time they were thinking from their point of view, it was obviously a pretty crucial time with two former members having just left, uh, Phil Judd and Mike Chan. So I, I, I doubt if um, the rest of the guys knew, knew that well where they were heading at that time. I think it was a pretty vague, vague time, and, and getting Neil to come over and, and take over on lead guitar was a, uh, a radical move, to say the least. Really, yeah, it was a risk in a way, it was a gamble. In fact, we th as soon as um, we knew we were looking for somebody, we rejected Neil straight away. <laughs> Thought about him and then rejected but him. I came back. And then Mike Chun, who left the band around the same time, said, Neil's got the potential, you know, think again. And of course we did think again and instantly knew that he was right. It was, a, it was just an instinct, really. Um, uh, Neil had written songs, you see, right from the age of probably 14, 15, whatever. Were they, good, were they good songs? Yeah. yeah they well, were. Not all of them. No, but there were enough good ones to show that he had considerable talent. You know, So really, it was only a small risk in terms of his guitar playing. It wasn't a risk in terms of the fact that he was a musical person. You know, we knew Mind that you, that was what I was being hired for, so it was pretty terrifying for me. 18 years old and all that, yeah. I mean, yeah. you whisked but away until... I wasn't I was... in the mix out front for about a year, though. 
<laughs> the guy who makes yes. the sound at live. We'd only put tiny little bits of Neil in. <laughs> we only found out afterwards. Which was great most nights, but there was the odd night where I really felt like I'd played really well, and so I'd go out and I'd listen to a tape that the guy had made out in front of us. We got to hear anything. It was terrible. <laughs> Eddie Rain is also doing some learning. One of the most admired keyboard players in the business, he's only now taking formal piano lessons. But after 12 years of playing, after 12 years of keyboard work with the band, yeah. you're only now learning to read music. Yeah. And you're only now learning to, to play the piano and what the piano can do and so on. Yeah, I'm really surprised by what it can do. And I'm completely disgusted with, with what I can't do, with what I thought I could do, but which I've found out I can't, which is play with expression and uh, sit down and play a piece of music um, which can convince people that I'm a good pianist. Because I'm, I'm hopeless. I'm really bad. <laughs> but I'm, I'm learning. I've been learning for three weeks now, and, I, and um, it's coming together very quickly. I can read music now. After three I mean, weeks. I'm playing Clementi, I'm playing Beethoven, I'm playing, um, what's his name? Mozart. Yeah. Do you like the music? I love it. That's what you call real music, mate. Real music. Enough of this bloody Clementi, Beethoven stuff. Do you remember what attracted you to Split Ends in the first place? Yeah, vividly. New Faces. At, at that time, at the time of the New Faces thing, they were really heavily into the bizarre theatrical presentation thing. Was it that that drew, them to, drew you to them, no. or was it the music? You know, I liked the look of the band, but in those days, it wasn't... Um, as heavily bizarre, as completely different as what it became later on. Uh, like that was about 1972, uh, New Faces, 1971, 72. And uh, they was, you know, they didn't, they weren't wearing that much makeup, and they weren't wearing Noel Crombie design costumes. They were just wearing sort of um, pretty normal clothes, a bit different. But uh, like all that really bizarre stuff came later on. And no, that didn't attract me to them. It was the songs, it was the feeling of the songs. I can't explain it, but uh, I hadn't heard anything like it before. Do you feel like you're far enough away from it all to be able to take what you want fairly liberally and yet be very much yourself? I think the split ends in the early days because there was no models in New Zealand to follow what felt free enough to be able to be as strange or as extreme as they liked and almost encouraged by the fact they were in New Zealand doing it, you know because it was both to be noticed, but also because there's no role models, there's nothing in New Zealand. I think New Zealand's right for the plucking as far as the culture goes. We haven't quite got far enough to find out what it is, but New Zealand, there's this sort of undercurrent boiling away there that'll be very interesting one day, I think. It's all happening here. At the great Narawahia Music Festival back in 1973, split ends played and the crowd didn't want to know. At Sweetwaters, a decade later, they're at the top of the tree, with platinum discs to prove that after ten years together, they've made the transition from cult enthusiasm to star status. What made you believe that, that you could make it not only nationally within New Zealand, but probably also internationally? What, where, did, where did that self-belief, that self-confidence come from? It just sort of came, it just comes. It's like a little germ that lodges itself right in there and sort of finds its expression in sort of things like ambition and persistence and doggedness. But you can't really say, perhaps it's a, a little nudge in the right direction from, you know, whoever, the powers that be, fate, whatever. You know, everybody has has moments in their life, I think, where they are steered, and the rest of the time it's up to them, but if you, if you get stuck into it, you know, I think occasionally you are certainly, you are helped, and all of a sudden we just seem to see the light. It was possible, it was definitely more than possible, it was probable, you know, it was, I don't know, we, when we started writing music, we just found, we fell in love with what we were doing, I suppose, and we just thought, it's good, and there's no doubt about it. 
Like when you fall in love with somebody, you don't, you don't analyse it, you don't doubt it, you just, you're, you are it. Uh, absolutely it. Yeah. So it's quite zen, really. <laughs> I don't know. Somebody else should come and hold one of these and know what it feels like. Bring it. Nathan, come on. Nathan, get in here. Come on, Nathan. Nathan, yeah, come on, show you. See how embarrassed I'm asking. Down the front. We've been saying for the last couple of years, anyway, that we'd like to uh, get in, into the use of the piano a lot more. But it's such a difficult instrument to fit into rock and roll and, and still have it sounding good. Why is that? Because um, pianos has such a broad frequency range or bandwidth as we in. In the business known as. <laughs> um, if you if you play anything, any of those beautiful rich, beautiful rich uh, bottom notes on the piano, which sound great by themselves, they tend to clutter up the bass guitar, and maybe the bass drum on the drums. And and uh, if you play anything in the middle of the piano, it tends to clutter up and obscure the guitar, which is a very middly sort of instrument, and the vocals. It, it obscures the vocals as well. Play anything up top. Um, you can obscure or, or sort of um, cut out the, the effectiveness of the synthesizers. Obviously part of the life, I mean, it's just part of the package of being a member of Split Ends is that you do a lot of touring. Yeah. Do you get jaded on that? I think, well, I think the band gets jaded. I think any band would get jaded after a certain period of time once, uh, when each show is done more or less like the one before. However, however different you try and make each show, it's inevitable, um, usually after, say, three or four months solid, that it does get jaded. And uh, when we feel that, we usually uh, uh, look hard at ourselves to how we can change that, how we can put new, uh, new freshness in the songs that we've been playing every night, new ways of playing them, new things to do. There was a period of uh, 77, 78 and 79 where we did three albums, one called Dysrhythmia, one called Frenzy and one called True Colours, and um, they were like from Dysrhythmia to True Colours. Uh, they, were like, they were like stepping stones. They marked uh, a general trend towards the type of music we were going to play on True Colours. A lot of people have said, or a few people have said, once a few people who make a lot of noise have said that we deliberately changed dramatically from like overnight. Uh, sounding like one thing and looking like one thing one day and completely changing uh, the next day. But that, it didn't happen like that at, ho at all. It happened over a period of about um, three years. But there was a, a bit of a, a deliberate change uh, in 1980. But it was not a compromise? Not at all, no. It's true, isn't it, that the, the changes that Split Ends have made over the years have been very threatening to a particular group of people who get used to you. Yeah. Um, I guess as a band with a fairly long life, you're always going to be up against uh, people who are hanging on to their past, and, and, and we're part of it. And so for them, you know, the best part of us was what they relate to as in their life earlier, perhaps. I mean, it's the way I often see it. You meet people who, who say, oh, I like mental notes, and, and they probably wish that they were still back then. You know? <laughs> but we're always looking ahead, you know, it's hard to 
once something's done, an album or whatever, it's sort of history really. We're, we're always moving on. That, that's part and parcel of the whole change really. could easily have failed on that very precept that we never accepted the need for change and um, when you do get out amongst it you come to Australia or you go to the rest of the world and you, you realise that in certain areas you've got no choice, you've got to change and, and the rest of the world influences you much more directly than it ever did when you were in New Zealand. I think as New Zealand bands some of them have tended to react badly to that and refuse to, you know, why should we, why should we come over to Australia and suddenly have to get professional and tight because all Australian bands are professional and tight. You know, it was like an inverted snobbery thing, which is a shame. You've got to, if you want to compete, you've got to compete. Do you still have that utter confidence yeah. that it's going to happen? I think it's, it seems almost inevitable. You know, I might be a, a foolish old man in my 60s and you can say, well, you know, where's your glory now? But... It just seems inevitable and I really think we'll get it if we work hard at it. And it'd be good. I mean, Australian music is starting to take on the world in a big way. It'd be great for a New Zealand band or New Zealand bands to start doing it too. I mean, most of it is for ourselves, but there's a bit of patriotism in there. I'd love to sort of wave the flag in America, be the first American New Zealand band to crack it there. I'd love to do that. But mainly because I feel like it's, it's part of our plan, you know. It, it's meant to be for split ends. Can you actually see a time when split ends actually split? Yeah, but I always think of it in terms of a club that will never actually fold. You know, like I can imagine us, as I said to you, at the age of 50, coming together and having a bit of a play because there's a, there's a rare blend between us, which is a wonderful thing in all seriousness. And, you know, I don't see it changing because we are, as people, a harmonious bunch, so why should that change? Unless one of us, you know, becomes a poof or something. What do you mean becomes? <laughs> Or but it's like, you know how you, we, you were asking about Neil and my family and that, and we were sort of basically trying to talk a little bit about the background. I thought it was interesting that you that you concentrate on that, because not a lot of bands would get asked that, and it, to me it implies that there is a sort of a family sense about this band, and it, without being corny, that's the way it's grown over the years with all the, the hackings and choppings of rotten branches and that. We're finally left with this delightful little family of... Log. <laughs> Band that plays together stays together. <laughs> okay, guys, a one, two, a one, two, three, four. <laughs> Actually, that was a lot worse than I expected. <laughs> 